Well, gentlemen, we're here to discuss a Glen Custom. Glen Martin. Custom 1600, also known as a Galaxy 1600, also known as the Star 1600. There's quite a few names that are associated with the king of the 250B tube. I mean, there's guys out there that probably have gotten a little bit more out of 250Bs, but as far as 250Bs built by well, they called him Dr. Glenn because he carried a doctorate and all kinds of stuff. And he had a lot of stuff going on. I've heard a lot of different stories, but this is a rare piece of equipment. Um, this is owned by my friend Gas Cap, and he's getting ready to move to Texas. He gave this to me about a year ago for me to go through and work on. I transported this back up from where he lives. Uh, to Boise in the back of my Suburban on one of my road trips through California. There are some problems with it. One of which that I know from the outside is it's going to need a new power cord. Power cord's kind of held together with electrical tape because the rubber jacket that makes up the power cord is, well, disintegrating and falling apart. Um, <clears throat> This is, this is funny to me. It says 40 to two meters. <laughs> okay. Uh, in the day, Palomar and Telstar and all of those guys would put all kinds of different stuff on the boxes um, because they couldn't come out and say, well, we're building this for 11 meters. This is a 10, 11 meter max frequency range amplifier. This is the four tube version of it. And this is one of the cleanest versions I have ever seen. I've had one other come here that was like beyond mint. It looked like it came off the showroom floor. This is very close to it. This is a beautiful example of Doc Glenn's craftsmanship. The story behind this amplifier is long and delineated, but I'm here to tell you it's on its way to Idaho and we're going to get it all put back in one piece. I don't know why, but they took the blower off the back for transport. So first thing we're going to do is we're going to flip it over. We're going to take the bottom off of it. And we're going to look at the input circuitry and we're going to reattach the blower. And then we'll flip it over and look at the top portion of it. But the bottom side is where all the magic happens anyhow. So uh, these things are incredibly heavy our pain and he has to ship and he's on his way here in a couple days to come pick it up so I I like time I don't like to be rushed on projects especially when it comes to tube linears because they take a large large amount of time to work on spend a lot of time waiting for the freaking high voltage to bleed off I have, there's a gentleman that's in the Northwest. Um, <clears throat> his last name is Smith. And he apparently doesn't know how to use a foot pedal because we were having a debate with him the other day in Pal Talk and he had himself a four tube Glen. And that's his big box that he claims does 30,000 watts or whatever. Whatever his problem is, I don't know. He's, I could go on for days about him. But anyhow, what we were trying to tell him is that you can put this for sideband, it's got an auto detect circuit and a delay. Then for AM, it's an auto key circuit, so you just hit the microphone and it automatically keys. Standby switch, where you can key the microphone, it doesn't do anything, or directed. His amplifier, the transistor that drives the circuit, gave up the, gave up the ghost on AM. And I was trying to tell him, hook a foot pedal up to it and take the knob on the front of it and put it on direct and step on the foot pedal and it keys up. And he's like, I don't do that and you don't know shit about amplifiers. <laughs> Which basically led to him for a whole day cussing everybody out on Pal Talk because for some reason that kind of behavior is tolerated. I don't know, in my world, people that act like that, they quickly get dismissed. 
If you're angry and talk a ton of shit, I just don't want to have anything to do with you. Sorry. There's more people in radio for me to work with. I don't go away. <laughs> you know? I get to choose who I have around me. But that's got nothing to do with this. The point is, is that the basic function? It's got a side mandalay, AM, standby, and direct, which means foot pedal. And I always say use a foot pedal because it makes your relays last a whole lot longer, especially when it comes to something like this, the way the circuitry is laid out. This is a bias control. And legit, this dials up the bias on the screen on the tube. How this works. Now on the back of this, there should be a variable, which we'll get to here in a minute. But for right now, I want to end this segment. I want to flip it over and I want to take the bottom off. And let's get the blower reinstalled. Let's start there. I hope everybody's comfortable. This is going to be a long video. They put a lot of screws on the bottom of this thing. And these are not the stock ones. I know this from working on my buddy Baker Man's plan for the last 10 years. These are an extremely interesting design on the inside. And I don't know why, but they used sheet metal screws to hold the bottom on this. It probably has something to do with the fact they didn't think it'd come apart all that often, but you can tell one that's been driven really hard. Like one of the prettiest versions of this I've ever seen was owned by uh, Bullet Bob. And it had never been apart. You can always tell an amp when it's been apart a bunch because the screws keep getting bigger. You take the screws in and out of something about a hundred times, the holes eventually strip out. So instead of doing like a pim nut, or replacing the rib nuts, guys have a tendency just to go down to the local hardware store and put bigger screws in the bottom of it. I don't know if that's the case or not, but I can tell you for sure that the bottom of Glen, or Tom's Glen is all sheet metal screws. Oh yeah. It says hand wired 8-25-1999 hardwire. Sheesh, look at this. Now it's wired. One second. It's wired with a 110 plug. We're going to go with its 110 for the moment. I've never seen one of these on 110. They're always 220. This board here in the front, this one here, this is the crux of a lot of the Glenn's problems. This was groundbreaking in its time, but today's day and age, this is very antiquated. Um, this entire circuit board could be less than the nail on my pinky in today's world. This is the timer circuit, this is the control board, this is the regulator board. These, this board is covered with a whole bunch of 16 pin op amp transistors, or not transistors but IC chips, pardon me. And it looks at all kinds of different stuff. It looks to see if it's got the proper voltage coming off the screen, proper proper bias control, proper 110 volt or 220. Um, here's our bias supply board that's over here. This filament transformer slash bias transformer, I've had to have that built. I've got one sitting here that is a six tube remote face. And what I mean by that is the whole face of the amplifier is remoted. Now, I take this back. Somebody has gone through and done due diligence and they put PIM nuts or crush nuts in here. So they did this properly. They, they put in the energy. If somebody had to go through and hand drill these out, put these in here, take the gun, 
crush these up because for a long time they were held together with just sheet metal screws. The high voltage section is brought on in stages. This is our high voltage rectifier section. On top of here is our filter caps and our bleeders. Please note we are missing a couple of the screws. It's okay, it's not a life or death thing. Um, a lot of these traces are a little warm. This is mounted to the side of the cat. Anyhow, it brings on multiple different taps and it slowly walks the voltage up as it starts the amplifier. Off of the first, I think, 400 and some volt tap that is applied is where we get our screen control voltage, and that's this whole circuitry here. On Tom's box, this resistor here keeps overheating. It doesn't matter what tubes we put in it. I ended up going to a much larger resistor on that, and then I ended up drilling a hole in the side of the air box and then using... Um, some medical grade PVC hose which was fiber reinforced and brought it around and mounted it to the board so it literally pressurized the bottom side of this cabinet and then drilled a couple little air bleeder holes over here. So I bled off a little bit of the air coming from the blower and routed it around and blew it right onto this bank of resistors and diodes. The other thing I did with Tom's box to make it almost indestructible is we got rid of these thousand volt diodes because these are all 1,000 volt, one amp. And really, you don't need anything bigger than that. We went ahead and I replaced them with 10 a 10s because that's what I had here at that time. And it has made the high voltage section of this box almost indestructible. But every single time that amp goes down, it comes down to this resistor. It gets too hot. It falls out of tolerance. The screen voltage takes off and the box doesn't run properly. So this is where we got to go next is into the bottom side of the tube sockets it's pressurized he said there was a couple things that there was some problems with them on the inside of this box the owner of this mr gas cap and he said to me i've put some string or something on there that allows us to see what he's talking about inside of here is a uh, input attenuator bank. Yep, yeah, right here. So, this is what he's talking about. He put red tape on this because he thinks this smoked, which, guess what? We know does. What causes that is the tubes are usually coming to the end of their life. They'll pull really hard on the supply. This resistor acts kind of like a shock absorber between it and the screen supply for the tubes. It gets hot, it pops open, protects the power supply, and protects the tubes from some wicked high, short, high voltage shorts. So over here, which we'll get to in a minute, this is our input attenuator. So the thing that you have to also understand with these tubes, the 250Bs that are in this, or possibly 350, is that a two, is that a three? The 350B tubes, it's great because it means this box is going to do a whole lot more power than 1600 watts. The 250s and 350s is they were really cheap because the military bought a billion of these. Those tubes were in everything. I mean, even the final section in the SR71's radio communication, VHF and HF communication systems, which was part of the the P dot tube at the end of the end, end of the or the nose of the aircraft was powered by the 250B, 350B tube. These were in F-15s, these were in F-16s, these were in F-14s. I'm telling you, at Raytheon, when they built this little tiny ruggedized tube, that's what the R stands for on 250B, R, 250, or 350B, 450R, 450BR, that R stands for ruggedized, which means they've done something on the inside of the tube to make it much more vibration resistant and so that it can carry a higher G-load angle loading on the tube otherwise you can take the tube and let's say spin it in a centrifuge or put it in an aircraft and make it pull nine g's and nothing inside the tube is going to bend warp distort they guarantee it for like 25 g's that's the r rugged i stands for this is our input matching network 
there's a switch here that's on the back that allows us to do high-low, which basically means take this bleeder bank, this voltage divider bank, put it in or pull it out of circuit. And he said a wire had come off, and he didn't wasn't too sure if it, he soldered it back in the right place, which, homie, you did. This is a Pi circuit. We have capacitance, an inductor coil, and then we have ourselves our coax for our input network. So this is also this board up front is what keys the amplifier. That's another one, another one of the things we have a problem with. This metal top transistor that's right here is the one that handles the actual function of going from transmit to receive. That's what this little piece of coax is doing. It comes across and it feeds over down into here. This is our sniffer circuit. This is our input circuit and it comes around and it comes to this relay. Yeah, pretty straightforward stuff. The RF comes back out, pops up here, goes through these bypass caps. This is the relay that controls our screen voltage. I mean, it's pretty straightforward and bam, right onto the tubes. So, I mean, the 250B is a really easy tube to build to. I want to say thank you, Double Seven, by the way. Old Double Seven down there, he's one of my mentors, and he's the one that walked me through and educated me about the 250B tube. Taught me a lot in a short period of time. And he explained it to me in a way that I would understand to be able to visualize it in my head which in itself says a lot it's saying I feel like I'm going to church working on this box this is like holy ground as far as amplifiers are concerned it's a very hard thing to find in this good of condition and I thank God for Tom letting me bumbly fart my way through his amp about 7,000 times so I can look at this with a set of educated eyes and really, at the end of the day, that's all we're trying to achieve is a set of educated eyes when we're looking at stuff. Actually, I'm kind of grateful that gas cap's coming to get this because it allows me to pull my head out of freaking solid state. That's all I've been doing now for like three, four weeks, and it's starting to get a little boring. I felt like I built enough four pills the last a couple lifetimes. But I can almost guarantee that this resistor's gone open. So we have no screen, no screen voltage, that means we have no gain control, that means we have no output of the tube. Let's get the blower prepped up. And while we've got this side of the box open, which is here and here, and then we gotta flip it over, take the lid off to attach the top portion of the screen, to the top portion of the blower. Let's get the blower mounted up. It'll take me just a couple minutes. And then we'll flip it over and we'll go look at the top side which there's not a lot to look at on the top side. We've got, you know, your inductor coil, your plate and load capacitor, you got your transformer. There's usually a relay that's on top that controls um, the transformer itself. Start with getting the blower on it. Well, it's a little bit of a bummer. I didn't catch this when I picked it up. There's a flange piece that sits on here it takes up the gap between the edge of the blower, the squirrel cage here, and the actual uh, intake. And I just called him. I said, hey, man, where's this flange? He goes, oh, I've got it. He had it hooked up to a piece of ducking that uh, he runs off and goes to an intake, like for an air conditioner vent or something, so it pulls ice cold air into the box, which is good, but it doesn't do me any good. This thing hasn't been run for so long that I'm going to have to run it for several hours and let the tubes degas. He told me for sure one of the tubes is bad, <clears throat> and he sent a bunch of 150s up here with it. Uh, <laughs> so I've got to manufacture that plate just to make the blower work, so in turn then I can get on with doing the rest of the repair. It sucks because this is going to add a couple extra hours to this job, but... So be it. I'm going to grab some black ABS plastic, 
We'll heat it up. We'll make it so it bends down in here. And we'll cut it off so it, it... All we need is something that'll take up this gap. Otherwise, this blower is going to spin. And whatever air it does manage to create, instead of it creating a back pressure and pushing it forward, it's just going to fly right out of here. So let's go over here and grab some ABS plastic. And um, we'll heat it up, we'll bend it, and make it so it fits that hole.
so we got the blower attached. We made it so it's actually going to push air into the air box now. Um, this all looks okay. This, on the other hand, scares me. And I'll show you why here in a second. Boop, 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 boop. Those connections scare me like crazy. But now what really scares me the most is the electrical taped cord in like seven or eight spots. So we're going to remove the white, we're going to remove the black, and we're going to pull the ground. I just went over to the ace of the Harding wear got us brand new three, or was it 12.3 or whatever this is? What is this? Yeah, 12.3. It should easily carry what we need to have happen. So this is probably going to get plugged into something that was wired with a 14 gauge wire. But uh, let's go in here and let's be violent and vulgar and aggressive about it. And when we put it back together, we're gonna to actually put a zip tie on it and a strain relief. So, on this note, let's trim it, trim it, trim it, trim it, trim it. We'll throw this in the garbage. We'll put this plug on this Z wire, and then we'll put Z wire in here and put a zip em tie on that, and we'll clean all these joints up and probably put some heat shrink on them and look at it, make it look all pretty. Because, come on, guys, you know me. It's all about the pretty factor in the wow, right? Okay, so we're at the point where we're going to do the observe and report. <clears throat> what I mean by that is the bottom side of this is all put together. The power wire has been replaced for the amplifier. The every, well, the air box has been put back together. The blower has been remanufactured. <laughs> we're at the point where we can fire this thing up. But what we got to do is what we've got to do is we've got to pull off all the high voltage rings because I know for a fact after talking with the customer one of these tubes is bad. So we've got to light this candle and we'll do it with the Variac and then we've got to let everything cook down for a hot minute. I want to see what tubes light up, what tubes don't light up um, and we've got to degas the tubes. And it, when I say degas it's not like they're full of some magic shit. It's that the tubes are not, there's no such thing as a perfect, perfect, perfect vacuum, but we can get pretty close. And how we get the rest of the little gas molecules out of the inside of the tube is we've created metals that will absorb them. Those are called getters. Well, the getters are part of the filament. So what happens is if a tube is on and in operation often, there's not a lot of free roam little molecules of nitrogen and oxygen and shit that can burn inside of there that causes carbon score in the inside of the tube. They get absorbed into the getters because the getters heat up as part of the filament, filament process. Okay. Well, these tubes have been sitting for, the amp's been here for about a year. The guy that owns it told me on the phone today that he probably hasn't run the amp for at least a year and a half before that. So for two and a half years, these tubes have been sitting idle. Well, the gas that's inside the getters can come out of the getters. It just happens. The gas will work its way out of the getters. And if you go and you hit this thing with high voltage right out the hop, what you get is a big bang because it's not a perfect vacuum. So we'll pull the high voltage off the top of the tubes and we're just going to let it cook for a couple hours. But I'm hoping, I'm hoping, and I'm hoping that the one tube that is bad, because around here I got a whole bunch of 250Bs and he sent up some 150s and some other stuff with this. I'm hoping that that one tube's got a filament breakdown and we won't see the tube heat up. Now, that electronic control board that's in here, we don't want to tiddly fart around. Like, we want to bring the voltage on. Like, we don't want to come up and be like, uh, sit here for three minutes and watch it. We're going to bring it up like this. 
and we're going to feel for resistance the entire time we're turning the knob. If we feel resistance, we're going to back out of it. Because remember, we got our filter caps and all that other stuff that could have dried out as well. Okay, switch is on. Here we go. Blower's not turning. Blower's turning. I'm not overly concerned about the noise it's making. It's just the plastic rubbing on the edge of the blower. But we got airflow. And our high voltage has come up. And we've got full output, or we've got reset. But it says we're in transmit mode. This is ready. That doesn't make any sense. Let's go, we'll shut this down. I might need to readjust that the conical cap on the blower, but we'll, we'll come back to that. the time set light. So we're waiting for that to trip off. We don't want to bypass it and go right into reset mode because this is the make ready light so when this clicks off it should go to the ready light which tells us that we're good. Well, let's see if that timing circuit works. Okay, this has got me concerned like it's going into transmit idle mode, but this is just a watt meter. So why is this hopping up? Timing circuit works. The reset works. That's good. Now I ain't listening to that blower for the next three hours make all that clacking noise, so let me figure that out. Okay, so blower is happy. Plate bolts is happy. Filter caps are happy. I have no idea if the bias is happy or if we've got screen voltage that's happy. But I do know this. For the most part, amp is happy. No high voltage on it yet. Now, unfortunately, the tubes are all heating up. And they're at idle temperature. They're all at about 80 degrees. So unfortunately, these have got to cook for the next three or four hours of my life. Precious moments of my life ticking away. There's no high voltage present on the tubes, but they're going to sit here and cook for at least the next three hours, if not longer, probably overnight. And we'll see what happens. I'll put the... Well, before we put the, the high volt rings on, I'll turn it up on its side and I'll prob, probe to make sure I got screen volts. And I'm assuming we got screen because the two, well, there's no high voltage, it can't run away. We'll probe for screen and we'll probe for our bias and make sure we got those volts present where they need to be. And um, we'll go ahead and attach the high voltage and we'll see what happens. And we'll, we'll load it up and we'll see out of these four tubes which one's actually heat up. This I have a feeling is an adjustment on the back that I can do. So I'm going to ignore this for now. For now. I'll put it in standby. We'll see you in a couple hours. Morning. So nothing's changed overnight other than these things have sat here and cooked they're Evan living guts out. Let's see how well our bleeders work here this morning. Oh, they're working good. Come on down. Come on down. All right, let's let the high voltage bleed off. Let me get my chicken stick out because I'm going to need it. 
put it away last night. We'll need this here in a minute. Let's hook this up where it's not going to short out to or scratch anything that we care about. Okay, I'm going to let this bleed down and completely neutralize the circuit. We're going to hook up the anode rings. We're going to hook the amp up and let's see what we get for power. Okay, here we go. So I've got my high voltage probe set up. I've got my foot pedal set up. I've got the input on high and that's a 1000 watt slug. 1000 watt slug on average and a 5 watt slug in reverse. Back from the bird, 10,000 watt dummy load. But oh, one, two, one, two, one, two. Okay, so let's start as we're waiting for this thing to come out of standby. Let me show what I'm putting into this for drive. But oh, one, two, about 20 watts. But this has got me concerned up here. But oh, so I'm putting a watt, or I'm getting a watt and a half back. So I'm putting 20 through it. And I'm getting about a watt and a half of that back in power. Hello. Okay, that is set at the wrong zero signal. So, let's see what we got going on for tube heat. All the tubes are at about 83 degrees. Now, I'm going to select key mode and I'm just going to hit the microphone. I'm dead keying one watt. Oh, cool, that's working. We're going to go to directed mode. I'm stepping on the foot pedal. So let's do first foot pedal first. Not to about half. This tube here is 89 degrees, that one's 99, 98, 93. So we've got it on high drive mode, which means it's got the attenuator in between the tubes and the radio. Oh, the input tune on this thing is disgusting. All right, I gotta come around the camera and I gotta get a different screwdriver. All right, so. Back here on the amp is our input tune. Down it goes. Okay, so what I'm adjusting is that little capacitor that's attached to the coil. And this is what I'm looking at. So I'm putting one watt worth of carrier into this. Let me step on the pedal. And I'm getting two tenths of a watt back. So let me adjust this. Okay, so now we'll go over to the high mode, which has got an attenuator in line. We got nothing. Let's go back to low mode. All right, so now let's jump over here. So that's with one watt worth of carrier going in. Let's turn the five watt slug around. So now it's reading forward. We're doing dead key in just a hair over a watt. So with one watt going in, 
getting approximately 400 watts out and that's with the quote and I'm saying this kindly air quote variable power at half that's at half so let's get this all cropped up so you can see what I'm doing Good. we'll crank this all the way to 10 Come off the key, come off the pedal, crank this back down to five. Now, everything has had a chance to really warm up at this point. This tube is low. So, this tube is 125, this tube's 115, back tube's 115, and this front tube is 90 degrees. So, we know we got a tube that's low. I'm encouraged because everything's working for the most part. So now let's go up to the 2000 watt scale. There's 1800. There's over two grand. Like pegging it over two grand. Now remember that meter on the front is just a suggestion. You always want to measure all of your stuff externally. So now we're on a 5,000 watt scale. Nope, oh, sorry, still on 2,000 watt scale. 5,000 watt scale, so we're reading that middle scale and adding a couple zeros. So, 2400 watts. Okay. You guys understand that I'm putting 20 watts of power into this amp. It's making 2400 watts worth of peak power and the power control is at half. Turning this up does it not make it do any more power. There's 2500 on the bird. And I haven't even bothered to look at this yet. You're showing me a thousand watts. Well, there's an adjustment for that on the back of the amp. Let's see what we got for tubes. Yeah, this right front. Take a picture of this. This right front tube. Look how hot this parasitic's getting. Look how hot that parasitic's getting. That right front tube is dragging big time. But for the most part, this thing is working just fine. I got variable power, so that means I got variable screen control. Yay, variable bias, I mean. Um, all the auto key functions are working. Thank God I don't have to get into that board. The time on circuit's all working. We've got a problem with the watt meter and we've got a tube that's going flat. I mean, these are not bad problems to have. This is 99% of this box is working. So one watt carrier. Bring us on down to two. Bring it on down to minimum. It's like we're on sideband. 
Steg key on one watt. Swing into 25, 2600 watts. It's not bad. For a three tube, one tube going down on it. Well, four tube, one tube going down on it. Twenty-five hundred, pretty easy. That's five. That's all the way at ten, and that's the power control that I'm talking about now. So dial that down to five. Okay. Now, if I can do this without killing myself, let's adjust our input for maximum peak power. And what do I mean by maximum peak power is when I'm modulating into the amplifier, I'm tuning the input for the lowest input reflect. And let's see what this does when we put it on low. So our inputs drop by half. This is cool. I love working on this kind of stuff. Okay, so here's an on high. The variable power knob on the front of the Glen at half. That's the lowest I can get that to tune. Okay. So now let me put the input attenuator in play. And that is... I'm going to change everything here, so watch. One, 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 one. Now what's that cost us down here for output potential? Remember, we're still running down a tube. So, back to low. Variable power knobs at five. 2,500 watts. Now I'll put the attenuator in line on high. It's 2,000 watts. It costs us a 500 watts, but now watch what happens. I take that variable power. Now it's within 100 watts of being like it's working on high. This amp's got more in it. It's got a lot more in it. I love the fact that we're only seeing about 130 degree exhaust air come out of the tubes, the ones that are good. See this one in the back corner here, the front corner here is still good, it's just low. It's 102 degrees. This one in the back's 100. One fifty, one sixty, one thirteen up here in the front, one thirty. The right front's a little low. So here's the problem. Is the process of finding him another two fifty B tube? is a long drawn out one because even if I had one that was sitting here that I knew was 100% I have to drop it in here and I have to let it run for a long period of time before I can go and load it up because this thing is a delicate little gem and I don't want to take any chances of putting a possibly shorted out tube because let's face it the 250Bs I have around here probably have been turned on for four or five years back down to 80 degrees. All right, let's go find a couple 250B tubes and see if we can get this process over with. Well, welcome to my world. This is what I've done all day. I had two flat rate boxes that were full of 250Bs and 350Bs and 250Rs. And so that tube actually heats up real good. I got another four tube 250B box that I've been slapping tubes in as fast as I can and letting them run for a few hours and I'm pulling them out and putting them in here because this has got the screen reset and the high voltage overcurrent protection in it which it's instant. 
So I don't have to worry about damaging this amp. So I've just been running through it. All of these tubes over here have either got low filament or low output to the point where they're almost ready to die. This is so far, this doesn't even belong here, this belongs over here, this is way low. Like, it's still good, but it's only putting out about 30 watts. So is this one here, this is a 350. I got it separated. So I've been gassing like a mofo. See, here's a 250, 250R, and when I put it in the amp, we get about 3,000 watts out of it. So it's not quite full, but it's pretty good. This one here, it's the same situation, so. And then this is the one that came out of the amp. But this is all I've done all day. Gas de gas, put an amp, and uh, Here's that original box. It was completely full of 250Bs. I'm down to three Svetlana tubes. There are two Svetlana tubes that I'm gonna go put in and test. And then I got all these other pulls. I gotta try and work through. I, I just wanna find one that's good for my guy. If I can find one that's good, I'm gonna call it a win. And then I'll move on and I'll do the adjustment here and fix this. And then I'll change the power level and we're pretty much set. So, anyhow, it's just I've been standing out here all day working with no video getting shot. And I thought I'd give you guys a little behind the scenes hiccup snippet of what I'm doing here. So, fun. Okay, so over here, right here, camera. Focus here. There we go. Full meter deflection is 2,000 watts. But oh. Now over here on the bird, we're reading that middle scale. So 10 is 1,000, 20 is 2,000. Five watts or five times scale. But oh. 2,000 watts. So, where we got the set is the screen is all the way at zero. And, and we're on the high function on the back of the amp. And I'm only driving this with about 30 watts of power. So this is gonna trip you guys out, watch this. Right at about 2,000 watts. Now, with no other adjustment, I'm going to simply, simply click it to low. That's 3,000 peak. It is working. Meters zeroed now and it's actually somewhat accurate. It's within a couple hundred watts. So, yay. It only took this many tries. To find one that was good. So, I'm gonna return the original one. Cause it's not bad, it's just low. This one's only making about maybe 350 watts max. It should be making a little bit more. But, in the same breath, I got all these virginal 350Bs that could go in it, but that's a different story for another day. And I don't think we get that much more out of it. I know for a fact that the 6-tube version maxes out at about 3,800, almost 4,000 watts. And that's the max we're going to get out of this power supply. So, I mean, we could put 450s in there and we're still only going to get that much out of it. It, you know, takes watts in on the power supply to make watts out on the, on the tube section. So, oh, okay, let's, uh, let's clean this mess up and um, 
let's reset here. So stuff down between the RF division wall and the transformer was this little envelope. And in this envelope is the original uh, A1 management services. A <laughs> A1, that's cute. PO Box 34060 Palm Station. 3778 Menatona Avenue, Suite Number One, Los Angeles, California. Phone number 209-948-3808. This is the original sales brochure for this, this amplifier. And as we can all clearly see, Max RMS Output AM 1600 watts max peak output sideband 3200 watts max drive level 50 watts well, I'm putting about 30 in it and I'm getting 3,000 out of it so we'll call that pretty good the power supply rating is only 2,800 watts of power so total 7,000 580 watts total of consumption between all four tubes, 117 volts at 20 amps. So you wouldn't want to run this off a standard 110 outlet today because that's now 15 amps and it's wired with 14 gauge wire. Well, I have a 30 amp 110 outlet that it's plugged into at the moment down here on the floor. It weighs 90 pounds and back when this thing was sold new it was $1,495. This is the one that's like what Tom's got, Bakerman. Or no, this is the model below the one that Bakerman's got. That was two thousand bucks. You got to think this. This is back in the eighties, ish. You know, RMS output two thousand four hundred watts, forty eight hundred. This is pretty close. The third division of harmonic is going to be at a negative 35 dB. That's awesome. 112 pounds. So they're claiming that there's 24 pounds worth of more shit in the same box for two other tubes. Huh? I bet you it's a four tube. No? Let's see here. 4,000 watts. Da -da 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 -da. That's got to be the six tube version, because uh, Tom's is a Glen Tree or Galaxy Three Thousand. It's still a Glen Martin. It just they started calling them different names. Available for 40, 20, 15, 10, 6, or two meters. Never seen one yet. Right here. Same thing down here. Well, all in all, it's back in one piece, run a new power cord. Everything's adjusted properly. Stuff's been soldered in the right spot. We had to replace one little resistor. And let's see what do we got here. Hello, what you? About 31. Hello. About 3,100. 380, 400 watts average. And they claim you can hit this with up to 50 watts. I, I would not be an advocate of that. I would go with the idea that this is more like a 30 watt max peak power amplifier. Well, I'm not going to bore you guys to death by putting the lid on it and that kind of stuff. I got to wait for this to cool down, the power supply to fully trickle down to zero. I got to pull all the tubes out and retighten out all the anode rings and that kind of thing. 
Um, I got a friend of mine that lives where this guy is going to, pretty close to him, and it's a way shorter drive than coming all the way to Idaho. So, this is going to get put on the Truck Driver Express. No brown shitbox kicker for this one. It's too heavy, too delicate, and too expensive. I wish I could find me a shipping company that was logistically good, like what the my first company was that ended up turn into shit but and I worked with those guys for nine years and the last four that I sent out with them they just they all got destroyed anyhow wish I could find a company like that because then I'd put this in a crate and send it but nah this, this is going to get hand delivered this little piece of paper A1 management logistics that's I mean, I guess back in the day, you should have just called yourself the Acme something company, you know? That can go right back where it came from. Gentlemen, I appreciate y'all tuning in to follow along. Big shout out to Siglent, Excess Power, McMahon Bird, Coaxial Dynamics. Absolute wonderful thanks to my Patreons, which is growing on a daily basis. If you've ever learned anything from me and you're interested in wanting to learn more and you want to come help support the YouTube channel, don't hesitate to take a second and come over and join us on Patreon. It's a buck. And if you do choose to join us, come put your call sign or handle in a call sign and handles post and I'll add you to the end of each one of these videos as a thank you. Um, come join us on Facebook, BBI Amps the group. I try to add exclusive content to all of these different little avenues for people to reach out and follow along. It's kind of hard, but I, I try to get it done. So I think after this, I got to go work on a hopefully not too junky pride. And then I got a solid state box I got to fix. So yay. Off to do more. Gentlemen, I appreciate you all. And from the bottom of my heart, and from the Glen Martin Company, we say thank you, and we're on to the next one. We'll see you. Click, click.